Hey everybody, uh, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. This episode marks the beginning of the end for the beloved cardboard door back there because I've finally got the time set aside to start on the door slab itself. You can see these pieces here. Uh, I've been working on these yesterday and today to get them to this stage. And these parts as they're laid out are the border for the door frame. And this door design isn't a traditional raised panel. It's all wood. Um, the way I designed it to get the look I want and use pallet wood for the main part of the door, I'm just making a border out of solid uh, hardwood. This is ash. You remember the pieces that I showed in a previous video. They're three by four uh, pallet runners. I've selected, milled those down, um, pick and choose to grain match, and then glued up and separated pieces to get to this stage. And I made the bottom rail three inches wide, the hinge uh, style and the top rail are two and a half inches wide, and then the latch style is seven and seven eighths inch wide. Uh, that's the proportion I want that I uh, ended up with using a SketchUp model. And that combined with the wood I had available, this is what I ended up with. And I'm uh, quite pleased with all of this. The rails for the top and bottom of the door are just pieces milled out of those runners where the styles had to be glued up. The hinge style is made up of two pieces, a thin one and a thick one, to get the two and a half inch width that I wanted to end up with. And the latch style is made up of three pieces. It's noticeably wider because of the proportions I wanted in the door. And if you look close, you can see that piece of copper wire that ended up in the pallet wood. And I was able to mill around it to preserve it and feature it in a prominent corner of the door. It dawned on me that there's kind of a fun play on words in here because I'm calling this a pallet wood door, but the center of the door is going to actually be this three quarter inch HDF panel. Once the door frame is complete, I'll infill the middle, which will be this panel exposed, and that's more like a painter's pallet. The door styles and rails make the frame, and the MDF panel makes a pallet. And I'll paint that pallet in episode eight with a unique method and design to achieve the look I want for this door when it's complete. With the framework for the door all milled to width and thickness, uh, the length is still rough, but the next step is gonna be to cut out that MD, uh, HDF center panel that becomes a structural integral part of the door. I probably better say here that this is an unproven door uh, structure and design. I've never built a door like this before. I'm used to the traditional raised panel with varying numbers of styles and rails and then uh, wood or glass panels going in them. This is all different and because I want the design to include narrower pieces, I'm relying on that center panel uh, for the structure of the door so it, it doesn't sag or rack over time. And I feel good about the, the thought and the design, but there's the possibility that uh, something might not work out too well for this door long term. If there's wood movement that I don't account for or it's more than uh, I'm accounting for, the door could kind of self-destruct in time. I don't know. I feel, like I said, I feel confident I'm going ahead with this, uh, with this design and the structure, but there may well be somebody out there that's tried something similar and realized that it was a fool's errand and went back to a more traditional door design. Time will tell, but in the meantime, I'm looking forward to creating a very unique, one-of-a-kind door and showing you guys how I do it. I determined the overall size and all the individual tenon dimensions for the center panel using a model in SketchUp. You can see the dimensions here. I'm using stubby tenons on the top, bottom, and hinge side of the door, and then I'm using longer tenons for the latch style of the door because it's wider, and I want to do everything I can to prevent that style from twisting after the door is made. This HDF panel is remarkably stiff and very stable, so I'm confident that three inch long tenons are gonna be good. And the first step in the cutting process is to cut out the overall size of the panel to include all the tenons. And even though this HDF, which stands for high density fiberboard, is extremely dense and heavy, it cuts remarkably well using a Freud thin curve crosscut blade and a forest blade stabilizer. And as a longtime woodworker, frustrated by the fact that knots seem to turn up in the least desirable places on wood, it's kind of nice that this HDF is not free and proud. The first cut I make is to size the panel for width, and because I don't want to use factory edges anywhere, I'll cut it at 30 and 3 quarters, and then cut it again for the 30 and a quarter inch final width that I need. 
and the initial cuts on a full heavy sheet like this are a bit of a workout but with some strategy planning and determination i get this cut to perfect width in a few minutes and because i don't have a sliding table set up on a massive saw in the middle of a cavernous shop cutting the piece to length requires a few extra steps but i'll still end up with perfect results I trim off about a half an inch from the factory end of this sheet so I have a fresh cut on clean material for this door panel. And because this door is only going to be as square as this panel is, it's imperative that my framing square is right on. And I'll show you the oldest method in the book for verifying if a square is square. Start out by verifying that you have a perfectly straight edge to work from. Place your square along that straight edge and draw a fine line along one blade of the square. Then simply flip the square over and draw another fine line along the same blade of the square. If the two lines line up, your square is square. Because the roughness of a saw cut isn't acceptable for this panel, I'm just going to freehand it and flush trim it with a router. That battery is about toast. You want for a straight edge as long as it is, in fact, a straight edge. And I'll use this piece of half inch Russian birch plywood for mine. I just carefully line it up on the square marks and clamp it in place with these mini bar clamps. And then using this half inch shank top bearing flush trim pattern bit, I just use the straight edge to true up the edge of my door panel blank. And it's just as simple as that. I always use my square to confirm that I got the results that I was after. And in this case, it looks like something shifted ever so slightly. So I'm going to give it another pass to make it perfect. I need to take about another 30 second off this corner here. And that's very easy to do by flushing up the straight edge on one corner and shifting it that little amount on the other corner. And that is what I'm after. And now I'll mark the 77 and a half inch length off that perfectly square, perfectly straight end. Draw some lines, rough cut, flush trim, and true up the other end of this sheet. Come on, Betty. You can make it. Come on. Oh, yeah. You go, girl. Woohoo. And as long as the edges of my sheet are straight and perfectly parallel, this end of the sheet comes out square also. And finally, I'll cross tape the finished panel to make sure something didn't slip by unnoticed. 83 and 3 16 two times. This process is always so much more dramatic shooting video for it. All I'm really doing is taking a 4x8 sheet, ripping it to width, trimming up an edge, squaring up an end, trimming and squaring another end. It's a very simple routine process, happens with almost every piece of sheet goods I do, but uh, setting up the camera and everything so you can see how a a big sheet is sized down into a perfectly accurate smaller sheet in a small shop can be done. The next step for this is to uh, notch all the edges to leave those uh, tenons sticking out of it. So I'm going to fire up my CNC, which is a, a carpenter navigating cutting uh, to get those uh, edges rough notched. And then I'll tune them up with a quick template that I think you'll appreciate. First, I'll lay out the locations of all the horizontal tabs using dimensions from my SketchUp model. And I'll make this the latch style side of the panel so I can mark the tenons at two and a half inches long. And keep in mind that these are internal tenons, so none of the fit shows on this. I want them to be accurate so I don't have a struggle to put the pieces of the door together. But in reality, a sixteenth of an inch tolerance here is actually overkill. I'll finish marking out all the long tenons on the strike side of the door and then use the same method to go around the rest of the panel for the smaller tabs on the hinge style and the top and bottom rails. After verifying that my sheetrock square is actually square, it's not made out of sheetrock but it is square, I use it to transfer the tenon marks across this panel because it's faster and more accurate than remeasuring. Once I've got all the tenon tabs laid out. I'll rough cut them close to the line with a little circular saw and then show you a great trick to clean them up perfectly and quickly next. And if you cut MDF or any of these synthetic materials all day every day, make sure you're wearing appropriate dust collection. I'm cutting intermittently here in the shop trying to speak clearly for the audio and I just make a subconscious effort not to deeply inhale while there's dust in the air. To some people, dust in the air is the kiss of death. To me, it's just another day in the shop. But let your knowledge and sensitivities guide your behavior.
and I leave a margin of about a sixteenth of an inch to an eighth of an inch between the rough cut line and the cut that I want to end up with. And here's what my tenon panel looks like with all the tenons uh, rough cut with a skill saw, but they need to be a lot more uh, neat and accurate than this. So I'm going to use a flush trim bit to clean this up too. But to make it quick and accurate, I'm going to whip up a little single use template next. All the tenons are exactly three inches wide. So I'm going to make a three inch wide rip off the scrap that I cut off the end of the sheet. The first cut cleans up the jagged edge left behind when I freehand cut with the skill saw. And the second gives me a rip three inches wide with perfectly clean and straight edges. The Sharpie mark down the middle of the piece reminds me which way the three inch dimension goes. And then I'll just cut five tabs Oh, about three and a half inches long. And this is one of those things that probably won't make much sense until I'm done doing what I'm doing. So just trust me and follow along. And this rip is the one that I cut off the sheet near the beginning of the video. And I'll clamp it so that it's perfectly smooth, straight edge lines up with the tenon shoulder marks on the door panel. I just want to see that pencil line. And then I'll glue these three inch wide tabs onto the straight edge while lining them up with the pencil marks on the, on the door panel. And there's few more ideal applications for using CA glue in the shop than in template making like this. Activator goes on the long straight edge, CA glue goes on the tab. And I'm using Starbond's thick CA for this application because these edges are pretty porous. And I'll remind viewers that Starbond has an exclusive special offer code for Next Level Carpentry viewers. There's a link in the video description below with a special offer code that will get you 15% off any of these great Starbond products at the Starbond.com website. So check it out when you're done watching the video. If you've not tried these products, they're great. If you've used them and your supplies running low, this is a great opportunity to get 15% off when you replenish your inventory. Since the tenons on the door panel are already cut to length, all I'm doing here is flush trimming the tenon sides and shoulders. I reposition clamps to make sure there's clearance for the router and then just follow along the template, cleaning up all the tenons and shoulders in one easy operation. And let he who has made no dust cast the first comment. And keep in mind, this is a woodwork shop where I collect dust, not a dust collection shop where I do woodwork. And that simple, quick operation gives me a perfectly straight edge on the panel and perfectly sized tenons all along the edge. To do the other side of the panel, all I do is flip the template over, rinse, lather, and repeat. And because of the sequence and process I used, everything lines up perfectly on both sides of this panel. And I'll appreciate that accuracy when it comes time to chop the mortises in the styles and rails of this door. And with that, uh, this template's job is done. I'll make another a uh, smaller one, simpler, to do the tenons on the ends using this piece of scrap and some of those same tabs to finish up the tenon sizing process. And I'll clean up the edge on the template scrap and recycle the tenon tabs all in the same quick process by retrimming the sheet on the table saw. And it doesn't take long to reconfigure a new jig for the ends, line it up, and flush trim the stub tenons on the top and bottom of this door panel. And template alignment is very important for procedures like this because misalignment means you'll end up with a very accurate mistake. And I'm always amazed at just how strong that CA glue is. And if you're curious too, let's see what it takes to snap these tabs off. <coughs> this pulls out the core of that material there and the glue joint wasn't even 100% full. Yep, that was stuck. That three quarter inch router bit leaves a three eighths inch radius in the corner between the shoulder and the tenon. And I can deal with that either by rounding off the shoulders of the mortises or by squaring up the shoulders on the tenons. And I choose to square up the tenon shoulders because it's quicker and easier. And a multi-tool makes quick work of it. And why do I get the feeling that somebody somewhere is going to give me grief because I didn't hook up my dust collector to the multi-tool to catch all that sawdust coming off this little blade. And I'll make a comment about this here and now because it would be easy to forget about later. But I take a coarse file and put a slight chamfer on all the corners and edges of these tenons so everything slips together nicely during glue up. Well, this door center panel is coming out exactly like it needs to now that I've got all those little tenon corners squared up. I drew a line all the way around the perimeter of this panel, a half inch in from the edge. 
or from this shoulder. And that represents the part of this panel that slips into a dado on the inside edge of the stiles and rails that'll make up the frame of the door. The dado needs to be exactly three quarters of an inch wide and then a half inch deep to accept this edge of the panel and help hold everything together, align it, and stabilize it. So I'm going to run that dado next. It's imperative that this dado is precisely three quarters of an inch in width and exactly a half inch deep. So I'm using an unusual approach to sneak up on it. I've got a mark here a half inch in from the edge of the piece and I'll use that to set the dado blade height. And I'll intentionally keep it just a little bit shallow. If you notice, I've got a 5 8 inch wide dado set up here uh, with the two side blades and three chippers. And with the Forest Dado King, this is actually 20 thousandths of an inch less than 5 8 But this is the method I use to make sure the dado is the right width and it's centered up. I accurately drew out the shape of the dado on the edge of this rail. And I'll center this 5 8 of an inch dado blade in between those two pencil marks that are 3 quarters of an inch apart. And the nice thing about this method is this cut where I hog out the majority of the material doesn't need to be centered up all that accurately as long as it's not touching either of the side pencil lines. You'll see how this works in a minute. Rushing air and the sound of the table saw prevents me from talking while I'm doing this operation. So this voiceover explains the process. What I do first is run that 5 8 of an inch dado down the center of the edge of each of the door frame pieces. Once I've done that, I check the depth of the dado and adjust the blade height until it's exactly a half inch deep. Once that's done, I adjust the rip fence on the table saw a little bit closer to the dado blade. And then I run my test piece through with each face of the board against the fence. And this means that the dado is centered up between the two faces, which is what I want. Once that's done, I check the width of the dado and repeat this process until it ends up exactly three quarters of an inch wide and by the nature of the process it's centered up between the faces. And that's what I need these pieces to come out like. The dado is comfortably snug but not too tight and it's centered up at ever so slightly more than a half inch thick on either side. And you can see here that the groove is centered up when I flip a short piece end for end on the long piece. And this should give you a pretty good idea what a door build looks like as I go through each of these successive steps. Even though it's an unusual door, there's a similar process for pretty much all the doors I build in the shop. I'll stop for a minute here for the obligatory call to action and ask if you like the kind of content you're seeing here with uh, deep in the weeds instruction on some of these more complex processes, then I'd ask if you'd subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. I try to pack stuff like this into every video I do, and when you're a subscriber, you're notified each time a new video is uploaded. I'll remind you to check out that exclusive Starbond 15% offer code that's in the video description, and you'll also see a link to an Amazon Influencers page there that has a list of the various tools, materials, and supplies that you see being used in this video and that you can see around the shop. If you're not able to find that stuff locally and you end up going through Amazon, I'd appreciate it if you use one of the links in the video description. You'll get the same low online price that you're used to, but Amazon pays small ad fees to Next Level Carpentry that helps offset the income I'm not making on my day job when I'm in here shooting videos that you can watch for free on YouTube. It's a wonderful thing and I really appreciate it. This is my latest t-shirt from Next Level Carpentry that says, how you do anything is how you do everything. I love the quote, and it's my mission to apply it to the work that I do here and that you see me doing. If you want a t-shirt like this or the shop posters that are hanging around here, there's a link in the video description, big surprise, uh, to Teespring where you can pick up that stuff. And a portion of the proceeds from those sales also help support video production. I think that about covers that. Um, oh yeah, go ahead and poke that thumbs up button while we're paused here, if you like the video enough to poke it, and that way YouTube knows there's something happening here at Next Level Carpentry and that I'm not just asleep at the switch out here in the shop. Enough of that for now. Let's get back to work and cut some rails. As it turns out, this is mortise chopping night here in the Next Level Carpentry shop. I've got to get all the mortises chopped on the rails and styles so that I can pre-assemble the door and get it out of the way because I've got a bookshelf 
slash cabinet job coming in tomorrow with a whole bunch of materials and I need the shop space. So I've already got the, the top rail here mortised out and I've got the bottom rail also but I'll show you the layout and mortise chopping process that I'm using on this door. Because the unusual design of this door I decided to do the uh, mortises in the top and bottom rail first with them uh, still running extra long. That's what this is. Then I'll cut these to length and ten in the ends after the styles are done. I did all my labeling and positioning of the styles and rails and then put initials on the panel and on the rails so I know what goes where. And now I just position the style on those tenons and at this point I can still slide the uh, style up and down to determine how much gets cut off of which end. I like the heartwood on this end of the style better than the sapwood at the other end. So I'm going to position this style here so that I'll trim off about that much after the mortising is done and everything's fit up. And using this approximate positioning method takes some of the anxiety out of this otherwise uh, dimensionally critical process. This is exactly where the style is going to end up. I just take a small machinist square and mark the sides of each tenon. And I do that on down the line. Keeping in mind that the pencil mark is actually on the tenon. So when I chop these I have to remove the pencil mark or the mortise will be too tight. I explained this before but this pencil mark is how far the style will slide over after the mortises are made. This is a half inch and then those tenons are an inch long. So the bottom of the mortise needs to be a half inch plus an inch deep. Inch and a half for you metric folks and I'm going to go inch and nine sixteenths just to make sure there's no clearance issues. To help guide the mortise drilling and chopping I'll use one of the teeth from my tenon routing template to draw a couple extra lines down in this dado to act as a guide. And that helps me do this step a little more quickly and a little more accurately. And anyone with a bigger shop and a hollow chisel mortiser is going to win this leg of the race. But this is how I do it here in the shop with a minimum of tools, equipment and space. Even though I don't have a hollow chisel mortiser I do have the luxury of a drill press. So I'll use the drill press's depth gauge setting to stop out the bottom of these mortises at an inch and nine sixteenths. And that is a three quarter inch Forstner bit that I'll be using to hog out the majority of the material in these mortises. And now using the drill press I'll drill a series of holes spaced pretty close together and overlapping to clear out the bulk of the material from this mortise so it's easier to clean it up with the chisel later. Notice that I drill the two edge holes slightly over the line and that just makes chopping that part of the mortise a little bit smoother. And even though it's a little bit oversized it won't weaken the joint appreciably and it really speeds up the chiseling process. Because I've got a three quarter inch dado in the style and I'm using a three quarter inch Forstner bit I just lower the bit down and let the cheeks of that dado guide the drill bit as I plunge it into the mortise. And this does a great job and quite quickly. Not quite as wonderful as a hollow chisel mortiser but equally effective. And I'll drill a series of holes just like that in each of the mortise locations. And it doesn't take long at all to pre-chop these mortises on the drill press. So now I'll resort to chisels to clean the sides up and square the ends. I could have drilled one more hole in here and made these remaining pieces a little bit smaller and easy to chisel but with a sharp chisel I can just shear them off with a good hefty push. Then I'll use a chisel and mallet to square up the ends and I'm kind of winging it here to get this job done tonight. My three quarter inch chisel is out on the job for doing door hardware so I've got to chisel twice with five eighths but still get the job done. And keep in mind as I'm pushing and pounding this chisel this isn't some punky pine or mushy mahogany. This is good very hard ash and I'm still able to get a nice clean crisp squared out mortise in fairly short order. And I'll do a test fit with my mortise block from the pattern. That's a little snug. So I need to shave these cheeks just ever so slightly. And 
And that extra little bit of whittling is exactly what it needed for a perfect snug but not pounded in fit. And if this was HGTV, you'd think that that's all there is to it. I've still got quite a few mortises left to go, but it's the same process, rinse, lather, repeat, to get all these squared up, cleaned out, and fit. Once I do this uh, hinge rail, I'll move on to the strike rail, and the only difference there is that those mortises are two and a half inches deep um, instead of an inch. So a little more work, a little more effort, but the same process. I did a video about a bunch of hammers a while back. There's a link to it there, but one of the hammers I didn't have in it was this mallet. I made this quite a few years ago, and it's kind of cool with a removable handle. And I used a, a white oak for the center of this, and you can see it's kind of failed over time. I kind of beat that down to where it's a problem. I need to use this end of the mallet. Uh, this other wood is uh, called hedge or uh, horse apple or Osage orange. That's the harder wood, and I should have used it for the whole face because it doesn't dent like this oak does. Oh well, live and learn. I can make some new heads for the mallet and slip them on that handle anytime I want. If you look close right here, you can see the little curve left by the Forstner bit outside the line for the shoulder of this mortise. It's insignificant at this point, but it really does make chopping the end square noticeably easier. With the mortises on the hinge style all chopped, cleaned up, and fit, I'm able to slip that style into place and then position the latch style where I want it vertically and then transfer tenon marks to the dado for the drilling and chopping process. I've got to drill these mortises deeper and with a two and a half inch tenon and this half inch shoulder, I need three inches. So I'll go three and a sixteenth for the drill depth. The mortises are marked out on the latch style. I adjust all the settings on a drill press so that I'm drilling these holes the proper depth for the mortise. I flat the style to a large block. It has a guaranteed square corner to make sure that these holes are being drilled parallel to the faces of the style. And I'll mention here that I made the tenons longer on this latch style because it's wider. A little ski wax on that hot bit helps successive holes drill a little easier. The tenons aren't to hold the door together, but they are my best effort to keep the style from ever twisting over time and with heavy use. And hopefully I've accounted for everything that this door will have to face in its lifetime. And drilling an extra hole or two on these deep mortises will make them noticeably easier to clean up with a chisel later. At two and a half inches long plus this half inch dado, chiseling three inches down into this mortise takes a decent bit of effort, but it's the same procedure as the shallower ones, only a little bit harder. And it takes a fair amount of chiseling, shaving, and testing to get all the way down to the bottom of that deep mortise, mortise, mortise. But my test block here tells me I finally got down to the bottom of that mortise. Two down and three to go. After the better part of an hour at the bench chopping out those mortises, the latch style is ready for a dry fit. And I'm anxious to see how it goes. And I think that's acceptable. The next thing that needs to happen here is I need to cut the top and bottom rails to length and tenon them to fit the dados on the styles. This is different from a normal rail because not only does the piece have to be the right length, it has to be in the right position so that the tenons line up in the mortises when the ends of the piece line up with the styles here on the outside. So I remark the mortises on the edge of this rail and then extend lines up the sides of the tenons so I can align those two marks. And I can see this better than you can, but I'll use a square to line things up. And then I double check my overall door width, 36 and 3 16 is what I'm after. And mark the length of the tenon shoulders on each end of the rail. So the tenon shoulders will be right here. And I need to remember to add a half inch length for the tenon on each end before I cut this to length, or I'll be one very disappointed puppy. And this is the stage of the game where everything 
is a make it or break it proposition. If I mess up anything on this rail, I get to start over and make a new rail. So I try to pay extra close attention to accuracy, lengths, details, and the rail itself overall to make sure I've got everything going in the right direction. And that includes consistently verifying that my orientation letters still line up. And I went through this whole layout and measuring process for the top rail as well. And now they're ready to cut to length. And of course, in my head, I keep saying, cut the right mark, cut the right mark, cut the right mark. And it's always nice to have a scrap left over off these pieces, because I can use this to set up the cuts for the tenon without risking damaging or spoiling the whole piece. I set the dado blade up for a 3 8 inch dado rather than a half, because it's easier to use the rip fence to set the length of the dado than to dial in the width of the dado blade. That'll make sense as this goes forward. I'm using a scrap from one of the rails to set the dado blade depth. And I'll start out a little bit shallow on purpose and then sneak up on the tenon thickness that I want. Now I set the length of the dado by adjusting the rip fence to the half inch measurement on a rule. With this setup, I need to cut the dado in two passes to get the full half inch width, but this is the quickest and easiest way to get this done. And as I expected, the tenon is still too thick. So I'll raise the blade half the difference and take another pass. And I'm always cautious with these height adjustments to make sure I don't go too far too fast. And that looks like it's going to work. And now I'll add a sacrificial fence to the face of the miter gauge to eliminate splintering as I cut the actual rails. And now it's showtime. In my experience, and it was the case here, that slight variations in the widths of these dados mean slight adjustments are necessary in the thickness of the tenons. But by dialing in the blade height and a few extra passes, cautiously sneaking up on it, I got the fit that I'm looking for on these tenons. Making sure my orientation letters are where they need to be. That tenon slips perfectly into place. And I'll use a pipe clamp to draw this up nice and tight like it will be when I glue it. And a final double check with the tape measure tells me I'm at exactly 36 and 3 16 which is precisely where I wanted to end up. And I got a similar fit with the rail on the top of the door. And measuring from the bottom of the bottom rail to the top of the top rail shows me I've got exactly 80 inches, which is what it takes to fit this door in the jam. And because of the careful work in the beginning with the panel, this frame is as square as square can be. Now that the rails are fit exactly like they need to be, I'll mark the styles for length and cut them off to the final height of the door at 80 inches. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the money cut. Cutting these styles to length is kind of a do or die proposition, but I will boldly cut what no man has cut before. While the camera was shut off, I took a few minutes to apply a fresh coat of paste wax to the extension table on my table saw so that this very heavy, very long, fairly wide piece of solid ash glides across the top and allows me to make a crisp, clean, square cut on the top and bottom of the latch style. And I stopped to take a second to add a square reference line across the back side of this style to make sure the cut goes the way it needs to. <laughs> All right, I guess this is the part where I take the cardboard door down. It's time for its replacement. And there's no time for emotions here. Suck it up, buttercup. Time to move on. Some of you may remember that the top hinge is installed four and an eighth inches down from the inside of the top of the jam. So I'll position the hinge at four inches off the top of the hinge style to leave a clean eighth inch gap between the top of the door and the head jam. After spending a nervous hour routing these deep double step mortises in this hard ash hinge style, I finally got everything dialed in to where the Sugatsuni hinges drop in nicely. 
If you're interested in the templating and mortise process for making these, there's a link in the corner of your screen to the video that goes into that in detail when I routed these mortises in the hinge jam. But I don't think you can ask for a more perfect fit than that. I'll use a VIX self-centering bit to start the pilot holes and then chase them out with a bigger bit because this hard ash uses a clearance hole about like in aluminum. And a little wax on the screw heads helps me drive them without worry of twisting off the heads. And I chose to do the mortising and all this other hinge prep work before the hinge style is actually glued to the rest of the door. Just improves the workability and if I don't make it easy on myself, <laughs> nobody else is going to do it for me. In an intermediate moment of truth, I did a test fit of the hinge style on the hinge jam and everything functions pretty much like I anticipated. I've got the small gap here that I wanted. I can adjust this down to a full eighth of an inch with the adjustments in the hinge. And when the door swings around, it's going to hit this corner of the jam at about 100 degrees, which is plenty of opening for this particular door, but obviously nowhere near enough for a standard door installation. I've got clearance at the threshold for the sweep that I'll put on the bottom of the door and the hinge action is copacetic. And you can see the mortises in the hinge style that accept the tenon panel that it glues to later in the build. After test fitting the hinge style and the hinge jam, I'm able to slip all the parts together for a 100% dry fit of the door assembly. And if you think this looks scary, well, I'm here to tell you it is kind of scary. I've got countless hours invested into the design, planning, implementation, shooting video, making parts, etc., etc. And this dry fit assembly is pretty much a moment of truth for the whole project. The only real de-stressor in it is that I've been able to test fit, dry fit, prototype each and every step along the way. So I'm not going into it blind, but there still is a measure of anxiety at a pivotal moment like this. And everything looks marvelous. So I'm going to run a couple screws from the hinge style into the tenon panel to hold this dry fit together so that I can do an actual initial installation of the pallet wood door. Oh yeah! First I remove the four Phillips hinge screws and the hinge itself. Then I use a snappy carbide tipped countersink pilot hole bit to drill from the deep part of the hinge mortise pocket into the center of the tenon panel. Then I chase that snappy pilot hole with an extra long eighth inch drill bit to extend the pilot hole deep enough for this three and an eighth inch screw. And finally, I put a little wax on the threads and run in the Torx drive screw that's going to hold the hinge style to the tenon panel securely enough so that I can hang the door. And when all that's done, I just reinstall the hinge so that I can hang the door. And properly piloted screw holes allow me to drive these screws in and take them out any number of times with no worry about stripping the hole. The two and a half inch tenons that fit snugly into the strike style and the friction fit that I get means I don't have to worry about any extra screws or anything to hold the strike style to the tenon panel. But I'm here to tell you this is one heavy door and it's not even done yet. As you might guess this is kind of a beast of a door to hang and I can't stop during the process to reposition the camera. So you'll have to take what you can see from back there. All I'm able to get is what the camera will take from a stationary position. But I will tell you that the design of the Sugitsune concealed hinges really helps with this process because all I have to do is get the jam part of the hinge into the socket and line up a machine screw and get it started. I'm using a softwood shim on the threshold and another block to kind of hold the door close to position while I do the final maneuvering so they can line up the socket head cap screws and snug it into place. And I'm not being overly dramatic when I say that a mishap hanging a door this big and this heavy could put you in the hospital. So staying focused and having a good idea of how things go together is a good idea going into this project. Whew, that sure feels good to have it this far. And you can see with this door probably weighs, I don't know, a good 100 pounds already. And it swings effortlessly on those hinges. Ruh row. Actually, that's exactly how I want this to fit and every door hanger knows why. Because they were paying attention and they noticed that I didn't bevel the strike rail or the strike style of this door for clearance on the jam. That'll get about a three degree bevel that allows the door to swing closed and maintain a nice gap on the other side. So even though it's hitting, you've got to love it when a plan comes together. 
Lucky for me, for this particular door build and installation, I could just slip off the strike style and run it over the joiner with the fence set at three degrees and put that bevel on there without breaking a sweat. And that's a little more like it. The door swings shut, but there's no gap left. So before the final glue up, I'll trim a little bit more off the edge of that door, but this is gonna do for now. It's kind of hard to believe how much work and how many steps go in to building a custom door. We're seven episodes in and the door is finally swinging in the jam. I've got a little ways to go, but I think the exciting parts are coming up. So I hope you'll catch the next episodes. If this is the first episode you caught, look in the video description uh, for the playlist that includes the steps all the way from the beginning when I went out and dug pellets out of the snow to build this door. I'll try to finish up the door itself in episode number eight when I actually paint the pallet wood door pallet with some horizontal strips of varying colors of pallet wood and a special little touch you've not seen anywhere anytime but you'll see it here first on next level carpentry so thanks for hanging out with me in the shop while i put this door together and i'll give a quick shout out to all the patrons on patreon everybody on this list has gone above and beyond with generous support for next level carpentry and i want you guys to know i really appreciate it it's helping this whole next level carpentry thing be a more viable business and with your continued support and generosity, I believe the best is yet to come for Next Level Carpentry. So for all viewers everywhere, until next time, thanks for watching. And here's a secret for everybody that's still watching. Plastic door hardware? <laughs> yeah, that's the next big thing.